boys and girls, we are going to do the story Dragon in the Rocks today, and it's going to go with the teaching point. Um, we've been working on character traits, on notice and note strategies, uh, and also just getting deeper into our stories and envisioning them, and looking at our characters, right, and identifying different things about them. So another way that we can get into the character's mind is by literally drawing a mind map. And I'm going to show you how to do this work today. We're going to do, use the story Dragon in the Rocks by Mary Anning. And it's written, er, excuse me, Dragon in the Rocks by Ma Marie Day. So it's written by Marie Day. The main character is Mary Anning. There we go. Okay, so you're going to probably want to pause me for a moment. And you're going to want to get a reading journal or a piece of paper. And you're going to want to draw just what I would call an open mind, which is an empty head. When you do this, um, don't worry about it being perfect. In fact, you can see my ears are lopsided and whatnot. That's not necessarily important. What we're going to do is we're going to write the character's thoughts and feelings in the head with maybe even a little icon of some kind to show how our character is thinking or feeling. And I'll model that for you so that you can see it. And then I'm going to let you try it while I read. And you're going to record up here different thoughts, feelings, emotions, character traits, and some evidence from the text. You're going to make some inferences. I'll show you an example, and then you can try it yourself. The other thing I want to share about this book, um, Dragon in the Rocks, is I've, I've had it for a very, very long time. And I love fictional stories that have done their research. Mary Anning is a character who is based on a person who actually did exist. She was a young paleontologist. She studied rocks and fossils. Um, and so I, I love the fact that this story has carried on that tradition and that idea and recorded something. Um, and of course, they have no way of knowing how exact the story or dialogue is, but it follows her life. So, Dragon in the Rocks, a story based on the childhood of an early paleontologist, Mary Annie. Millions of years ago, dinosaurs roamed the earth. Strange creatures swam in the sea. When they died, sand covered them where they lay on the ocean floor. Time passed. The ocean boiled and bubbled, volcanoes erupted underwater, and the floor of the sea heaved up to form great cliffs. Those ancient creatures vanished forever, and the cliffs became covered with trees and grass and wildflowers. Then people appeared. They settled in pleasant places overlooking the sea. 200 years ago, in a little English seaside town called Lyme Regis, Mary Anning was born. And so, they set you up for this story in Lyme Regis. Okay. And England, English, so it must be London, um, or England, excuse me. Mary grew up in a small house with her mother and father, her brother Joseph, and her dog Trey. Early each morning, Mary helped her mother make bread, while Joseph helped his father saw wood in his shop. The little house smelled of fresh bread and new-cut wood and fragrant flowers, for Mary's mother always kept a bouquet on the table. So here, I can infer that this is a very happy family that Mary Anning grew up in, and I can do something like this. I can draw a little heart, and I can write the word family. And my evidence, um, I could do a dot, 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 because I'm just going to pick up a little piece. House. Smells of fresh bread. And it continues. So I can go back and find that quote if I need to talk about this in a book group or something else. Um, I would also jot a page number normally, but this being a picture book, it doesn't have a page number. So as I read now, I want you to put down this character's emotions that you identify through different things where the author shows you, not tells you, 
How Mary Anna is feeling. You can do pieces where they tell us also, but we're working on our inferring, reading between the lines. And so this is a great opportunity to do that, to look at a piece of text and recognize what feeling or thought or character trait the author wants us to notice. And it's kind of fun because you can do a little artwork too. Um, and my cat is desperate to steal a pen from me. That's what he likes to do. Okay, here I go. Mary's father made furniture to earn a living, but what he really liked best was collecting fossils. In those days, a lot of people spent their time puzzling over these strange objects they found lying on the beach and buried in the cliff. There were odd-looking fish skeletons, giant seashells, and even plants, all as hard as stone. How did they get there? Could these fossils be clues to the unknown world of long, long ago? Mary and her father often went down the steep path to the beach. They loved the smell of salt air and the sound of pounding waves. Sometimes after a heavy rain, huge chunks of clay would fall from the cliff and crack apart as they landed on the shore. When Mary and her father examined the pieces, they found mysterious bones and shells stuck inside them. So here's where we start to learn about how Mary Manning became a paleontologist, I think. So I might write that word, paleontologist, draw a shell next to it and talk about, say, father and daughter went to the beach. So as you're writing, or as you're listening, you're going to want to be jotting some ideas, some thoughts, feelings, emotions. Also sounds like they're very close, so I could write the word close. Mary learned from her father how to chip the rock hard clay with a chisel and split it with a special little hammer. If she did it just right, a fossil would slide from the rock almost as easily as a baked cake slides from a greased pan. Mary's mother proudly placed the finest fossils on the mantelpiece where everyone could admire them. And where is my girl when I need help with sweeping floors or collecting eggs from under the hens? She often said with a smile. She's down at the shore collecting fossils. It was true. Every day, as soon as school was over, Mary wanted to rush down to the beach to search for treasure from the cliffs. Mr. and Mrs. Anning sold many things on a stand in front of their house. Lace and bonnets made by Mary's mother. Tables and chairs made by Mary's father and Joseph. Strange objects that Mary and her father had collected. Come buy a fossil! Mary's father would cry, the bone of an ancient crocodile, a flower now turned to stone that waved in petals at the bottom of the sea when the world was young. Come by a treasure, Mary would echo, the tooth of a cruel shark that lived long ago, a shell that sparkled like gold. So here she is, thinking about these things. Do you have anything you want to add to our mind now? All their lives, Mary and Joseph had heard about a huge fossil trapped in the cliff. The great grinning creature lay in a faraway cove where the sea crashed and foamed. Their father had been there. Many an evening he would tell them about the strange creature in the rocks. Its teeth are like razors and its eyes as big as saucers. Their father would begin. It's waiting there now, grinning in the dark. It looks like a dragon. Its body is as long as a rowboat and its head as long as a man. Take me there, father, Mary always begged, please. Joseph wasn't nearly as eager. Why get so excited over some old fish bones? He would scoff. It would be hard to count the number of nights Mary asked her father to tell about his journey to find the dragon. Again and again, she heard about the treacherous climb up the slippery black cliff, how the sea soaked him through, through, how frightened he was, how he shivered with cold, how, when he was ready to give up, he saw the thing right above his head and stared into its great eye at last. Mary longed for the day when she would see the giant dragon for herself. I love the way this author shows you the emotion and the feeling. There's just so much you can put in the mind map. Okay. 
One cold, rainy morning, Mary went down to the shore with Trey. Her father was very ill and could not leave his bed to search for fossils. Hello, Mary, a voice rang out. It was her father's good friend, Captain Fossey. Everyone called him Captain Fossey because he spent every morning, noon, and evening collecting fossils on the beach. His wide plumed hat had fossil shells sewn all over it. Captain Fossey had seen the great dragon too, and he said when she was big enough, he'd go with Mary and her father to find it again. As always, Captain Fossey rummaged in the deep pockets of his coat and brought out a present. Something, for spe something very special today, Mary, he said. He put a lovely flat round stone in her hand, a dragon's eye. I'm sure it is. Take it along and show your father. Oh, thank you, Captain Fossey. Father is so sick, and it will cheer him up, said Mary. Little plot twist there, I think. How do you think Mary's feeling, given how she responded to Captain Fossey about her father's illness? That would be something to jot. Mary came home to find the house strangely quiet. She held the dragon's eye stone tight in her hand. Trey wagged his tail anxiously and looked up at her. They both knew something had happened. Then, Mary heard the sound of someone coming down the stairs. It was the doctor carrying his black bag, followed by her mother and Joseph, whose face was red from crying. The doctor put his hand on Mary's shoulder and patted it gently. You must be brave, Mary, he said for your father has left us forever. After a week had passed, Mary's mother spoke through her tears. We are poor people. What will become of us? I will go to the town of Axminster, where there is plenty of work, said Joseph. It is not too far, and I will send money home every week. And Mary said, don't worry, mother. I will leave school and spend all day finding fossils. Trey will help. We will sell them just as we always have. I know that is what Father would want. Can you imagine leaving school to support your family as a young kid? Wow, times are different. Soon, Mary was very busy. While her mother sold lace and bonnets on the stand outside the house, Mary went each day to find strange and wonderful fossils down at the shore. She took her discoveries to the busy place where the passenger coaches stopped to give the horses a rest on the way to Axminster. While the horses rested, the passengers got out to stretch their legs, and Mary displayed her basket of fossils for sale. The ladies and gentlemen often left her with an empty basket and her pockets full of coins. Joseph sent money as he promised, and he came home often. One fine summer morning, when Joseph was visiting, he and Mary decided to go down to the beach. They stopped for a few moments on the cliff and watched the puffy clouds passing by the blue sky. Suddenly, they heard someone calling their name from the shore below. It was Captain Fossey. The weather is perfect for dragon hunting, he shouted up to them. The sea is calm as glass and the wind is steady. Mary grabbed Joseph's hand and they flew down the path to the shore. Trey jumped and barked alongside them. They were going to see the great fossil at last. Teeth like razors and eyes as big as saucers. Captain Fossey held Mary and Joseph a long, whoops, Captain Fossey led Mary and Joseph a long, long way along the rocky beach, and then they began to climb the steep, wet cliff. They clambered high over dark, slimy rocks and down past caves full of black shadows and crashing waves. Mary's heart beat fast as they edged across a narrow, slippery clay ledge that threatened to break off suddenly and fall into the sea. When they stopped to catch their breath, Mary looked back towards Lyme Regis. It was so far away, the houses looked like little toys. When will we be there, Captain Fossey, she asked. Captain Fossey shook his head. I don't know, he said, gazing out to sea. And now the wind is coming up. See, the tide is rising too. We'll have to turn back. Just then, Trey started to bark from somewhere right above them. There it is, there, look up, Joseph shouted.
So what feelings or thoughts might be going on in Mary Annie's head right now? This would be a great place to jot. You could even pause me and add more detail. You could re-listen to a piece. Half buried in the dark rock was the largest skeleton Mary had ever seen. It was more strange than the dragon in her dreams. It was as long as a rowboat. Its huge mouth was bigger than her whole body and full of razor sharp teeth. Its eye was much bigger than a saucer. It was bigger than her mother's biggest plate, the one that the Christmas goose was served on. I like that comparison. We must go, Captain Fossey said. Hurry now, the tide is rising fast. Mary was so entranced that she hardly heard him. When Joseph took her hand and pulled her away, she realized with a start that the ocean waves were dashing over her feet. The journey back was hard. More than once they had to scramble up the cliff as the waves grew stronger and crashed into foam just beneath them. When they arrived home, it was very late. Mary's mother scolded as she wrapped them in her warm shawl. As Mary and Joseph dried themselves by the fire, they described every moment of their adventure. I'm going to dig it out of the cliff. I know I can, said Mary, when they finished their tale. Oh, no, you can't, said Joseph. It's huge. Mother, far too big a fossil for her to tackle. Nonsense, Joseph, their mother replied. If your sister is determined to dig that creature out of the cliff, she will. Soon, every fine day, Mary could be seen making her way down the beach. She always wore her father's old hat to bring her luck. Little Trey was by her side. He liked to carry her basket of tools up and down the cliff. While the tide was low, Mary chipped away at the rocks. When she carved out a few chunks, she would take them to a sheltered stretch of beach. There, she hammered and pried at the rock-hard clay until the bones within were freed. Back to the skeleton, she climbed again to start all over. The weeks and months went by. The work was hard. As the hidden parts of the huge sea creature slowly emerged from the clay, Mary asked herself questions about it. What was her dragon like when it was alive? What color was it? Green, blue, red, striped, like a sunfish? Ooh, she's very inquisitive. I would put that up there. What did it eat? Down deep in the ocean, even as it hunted, did even bigger creatures hunt for it? Was one of them trapped in the rocks, waiting now for her hammer to release it? So she's asking scientific questions there. That's pretty cool. Mary had a plan to put the great creature together again. She had drawn a picture of the whole skeleton as best she could and had given a number to each bone. Now as she chipped each bone from the rock, she numbered it. Then she carefully wrapped each one in plaster and cloth to protect it. The baskets she carried back to her father's workshop at sunset each day were very heavy. Sometimes strong stone cutters came to help Mary. They were used to hard work. They laughed and sang as they helped her chip the bones out of the rocks. They teased Mary with a tongue-twisting chant. She sells seashells by the seashore. It made her smile even when she was very tired and her body ached from head to toe. So the author wants us to know that she's putting in a lot of work. She's a hard worker. Again, that's another feature I could put in my mind behind me. It doesn't say she's a hard worker. It tells us, right? Or it shows us her body ached from head to toe. That would only happen if you worked really hard. Finally, she pried the very last bone from the steep clay cliff. Mary set to work cleaning the last bits of rock from each bone with small files and brushes. When that was done, she began to put the creature's bones together again like a huge jigsaw puzzle. She had numbered each bone so carefully that the creature took shape almost like magic on the floor of her father's workshop. Her mother brought her meals to her there 
for she would not leave until the giant fossil was complete. Word traveled all the way to the great city of London about a little girl who had dug a huge ancient creature out of the cliff. Many people didn't believe the story. How in the world could a child of 12 do that? Okay, that's the first time we heard how young she was. One day, five important scientists came all the way from London to see Mary. They crowded into her father's workshop and marveled over the giant fossil. They were amazed to see how perfectly Mary had arranged the creature's bones, just as they had been in the clay. They could hardly believe their own eyes. Please tell me, what is this creature I have found? Mary asked eagerly. The scientists explained that she had unearthed the rare skeleton of an ichthyosaur, a giant fish lizard that had lived in the ocean millions of years ago. Like a whale, this mighty animal came to the surface for air. It had looked something like a dolphin, only much, much bigger, of course. Will you allow me to buy this remarkable fossil? asked one of the men. I'd like to take it to a famous museum in London, where thousands of people can see it. Mary nearly cried from joy. How proud father would have been of her. That night, all the neighbors gathered on the beach to celebrate with Mary. Joseph brought a present for his sister, a chair that he had made himself covered in red satin. Mary's mother gave her a lovely lace collar to wear. There was plenty of cake and cider and lots of singing. The blacksmith played his fiddle and the schoolmaster joined in with his accordion. Trey ran around and around in excitement. Captain Fossey raised his cup high and shouted, A toast to Mary, the greatest of all the fossil seekers. Everyone clapped and cheered. As the moon set and the stars became brighter, the people of Lyme Regis were still singing and dancing and talking about the giant ichthyosaur. Mary was very happy. She just knew that there were other wonderful creatures to be discovered in the cliff. The next day, she was going to set out to find them. Mary Anning was a real person. With the help of her mother, she continued to search for fossils and she spent the rest of her life digging in the cliffs of Lyme Regis for mysterious creatures from the past. When you hear the tongue twister, she sells seashells by the seashore. Think of Mary Anning, for it is said that the she who sold the shells was her. And if you go to the Natural History Museum in London, look for a creature with teeth like razors and an eye much bigger than your mother's biggest plate the one that the holiday meal is served on. And if the creature is longer than four men put together and has flippers shaped like paddles, then you too have found Mary's dragon in the rocks. So, I also did this assignment because I wanted you to see how a finished one might look. And so here is my dragon in the uh, rocks, my map. And I realized as I read it, this time I had a whole different set of emotions and character traits and ideas to record. Um, so I feel like this one was what was obvious. And then in my rereading, I saw what else I could find. And that's a good reminder that sometimes we need to kind of reread things to go deeper. Um, so I captured excitement, um, Captain Fossey and the fossil determination. She wouldn't give up, right? This is Mary Anning's head. I wrote, loves the beach and family, fresh bread and new cut wood, reminds her of mom and dad. I tried to draw a little shell here. Um, make, uh, mother jokes about her collecting fossils and is proud of her. She's longing. I want to see bigger fossils, and I just thought the word when captured that. So you can see I have different things that I noticed. Um, famous Museum of London that I captured and I put down of all the different things that my character probably has going on in their brain, just like we have all these different thoughts and feelings in our brains. And so when we can get inside the character's shoes and really see them and feel them, we can go, we can envision our story better. So that's the thought I want to leave you with today. Go ahead and